This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help me produce more content like this, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought and get early access to every new episode. When you think about what defines the United States, what comes to mind? Big cars, big flags, McDonald's, probably all the stereotypical stuff, but I'd be willing to bet that for most people outside the US, one of the first things that comes to mind is our incredibly massive and powerful military, and that's no surprise. With over 600 military bases in other countries and a near-constant armed occupation of various regions, it makes sense that the only experience many people have with the US is our military presence. Despite what US news sources would have you believe, our military is not a welcome sight in much of the world. Far too often, the sight of US fatigues means imminent death, often for unarmed, innocent people. But over the years, a new type of armed American has started appearing in US-occupied regions. And these people are even less accountable than the US military. In this episode, we're going to talk about private military companies, the recent Blackwater pardons, and how these mercenary groups fit into the US imperialist framework. We all have a good sense of what the US military looks like. With a larger budget than the next 10 nations combined, we have more planes, ships, helicopters, and armored vehicles than we know what to do with. But what exactly is a private military company? These companies, PMCs for short, are private companies providing armed combat or security services for financial gain. The operatives, known as contractors, who are employed by these companies are often hired as protection for notable figures, armed security for US corporations in unreceptive regions, and for covert missions at the behest of the US government. Of course, contractors who use military force in a war zone are considered unlawful combatants by the Geneva Convention. But, as you can imagine, we tend to ignore the rules that the rest of the world has to follow. US PMCs have operated in over 50 countries and on every continent except Antarctica. Back in the 90s, there used to be 50 military personnel for every one private contractor. Today, the ratio is 10 to 1. Considering the US is home to over 1.3 million active duty personnel, that means there are somewhere around 130,000 armed Americans committing acts of violence in regions around the world at the direction of US corporations, wealthy individuals, and intelligence groups. We'll get to the significance of this fact a bit later. But first, let's consider the recent presidential pardon of four Blackwater contractors for crimes they committed during the US occupation of Iraq. Blackwater, now known as Academy, was founded in 1997 by former Navy SEAL Eric Prince, who is, coincidentally, the brother of Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos. Blackwater started out as a shooting range and training facility for the armed services, police, and security personnel, but after the invasion of Iraq became an active and lucrative private military company. Since 2003, the company has received billions of dollars in contracts from the US State Department, the military, and the CIA for work they've done in Iraq and Afghanistan, which has run the gamut from protecting various dignitaries, to securing oil fields, to mercenary violence. But what really put Blackwater on the average American's radar is the atrocity committed by four of their contractors in September of 2007. Okay. I was on a bus when the shooting started. Heavy fire came towards us. I felt the first bullet hit my leg as I scrambled off. I kept running towards the bus station, then I got hit again. When I stopped, I was hit a third time. I felt like the bones in my leg had exploded. I fell down and started to crawl. There was utter chaos. People were terrified, trying to save themselves. This video was filmed after the attack. 14 Iraqis, including two children, were killed and at least 20 others injured when a heavily armed convoy of contractors with the American security company Blackwater opened fire at a busy intersection in the capital, Baghdad. Just before noon on September 16, 2007, a team of Blackwater contractors operating under the callsign Raven 23 opened fire in a traffic circle in Baghdad. According to their official statement, their vehicles had taken fire and one of them had been disabled, at which point the Blackwater operatives started shooting at everyone around them. Eyewitness accounts and a US court of law determined this to be a lie. The contractors murdered 17 people that day and wounded 20 more. 14 civilians died on the scene, two of whom were young children, just 9 and 11 years old. According to people in the square that day, and to later evidence compiled by the FBI, the Americans had not been provoked, and had simply decided to kill innocent civilians. One military officer commented on the massacre, saying, It was obviously excessive. The civilians that were fired upon, they didn't have any weapons to fire back at them, and none of the Iraqi police or any of the local security forces fired back at them. Despite all this, the men continued to shoot, including at cars that were turning to get away. Even though the evidence of this heinous crime was apparent from the beginning, it took years for the murderers to be convicted. 
In October of 2014, over seven years after the massacre, four men were finally prosecuted for their actions. Nick Slatton, the sniper who first opened fire, was sentenced to life in prison, while three other men, Dustin Hurd, Evan Liberty, and Paul Slough, received 30 years, later reduced to 12 to 15 years each. Then, on December 22, 2020, President Trump granted a full pardon to each of the four men, citing, quote, a long history of service to the nation. The response among the victims' families and the general public has been rightly critical. When I heard about Trump's decision, I was shocked and disappointed. We are the victims and those men are the murderers. I thought the U.S. justice system was independent, but it seems justice is affected by U.S. politics. The Iraqi foreign ministry quickly reacting, saying the president's pardons ignored the dignity of the victims and the feelings and rights of their families. Many Iraqis have long felt the incident showed Americans did not value Iraqi lives. At least 14 civilians lost their lives that day. The youngest, nine-year-old Ali, shot in the head in the back seat of the car as his father helplessly watched him die. My son was the heart of our family, Muhammad Abdul Razak says. Another person who we spoke to was pleading with President Trump to not release these men, to not allow them to go free because he said they were the ones who were terrorists. There's a lot of shock today in Iraq and in fact beyond because of what has just taken place. A lot of, as you heard in Barbara's package there, people being reminded of something that they have felt for a very, very long time. And that is that Americans, they really just don't value Iraqi life. Then, of course, you've got Fox News giving full-throated support to the pardons. Uh, what the president did for those Blackwater contractors, it's been described as a massacre. What it was is the fog of a moment where they were doing their job to protect State Department employees in one of, the, one of the most dangerous parts of Baghdad at one of the most dangerous moments. A lot of the evidence totally mischaracterized, mishandled by Iraqis, many of which had ties to insurgents. They were tried in a civilian court, which has no connection uh, to what it's like to be in that war. They volunteered to be there. And a huge credit to the commander in chief who there's no upside to a call like this other than sending a signal to our war fighters whether you're a contractor or in uniform we're going to have your back when you make tough calls on the battlefield much like some of the pardons he gave uh for other members of the military before so kudos uh from my perspective to the president for doing what he did for those black water I don't know, Pete. Maybe these guys were charged in a civilian court because they're civilians. They're not military personnel. They're cosplaying as special forces while getting to operate completely outside the regulations of the military. Of course, we can all expect this kind of behavior from Fox News. But what's more disappointing is the reaction to the pardon by the pastor of one of the Blackwater thugs. That's, that's the kind of stuff that um, sweet um, Christmas movies are made of. Honey, he's been pardoned. Free pardon. Totally full pardon. He's home. Just a just a sense of joy of knowing um, that these the children are going to be with their dad. The complete lack of recognition of the cruelty of this statement is shocking. The kids will have their dad back. Imagine the families of the victims hearing that and seeing that footage, knowing they will never get their loved ones back specifically because of this man. Um, he thought everybody was okay that they had lived through a miracle. Uh, when one of the cousins in the back seat said that Ali was hurt. Um, Mohammed got out of the car, opened the door, went to the back seat, uh, saw blood on the inside of the window, uh, and Ali slumped over against the glass. He opened the door, and this is a bit graphic, but what happened was Ali slumped towards Mohammed. His skull was open, and a portion of his brain fell out onto the pavement in the source square. Forgiveness is admirable, but that's not what this is. This is blind support of U.S. brutality, and it's wrong. So yes, what the president did was reprehensible. These four people massacred innocent men, women, and children, and will now walk away scot-free. But here's the thing. Trump is just a convenient scapegoat in this situation. Take CNN, for example. They jumped at the chance to slam Trump for his pardons, as was justified. But they're also counting on the fact that we've forgotten that they were some of the loudest proponents of the war in Iraq. Their fear-mongering, and that of the other big networks, played a major role in allowing atrocities like the Blackwater Massacre to happen. The media's job is to manufacture consent for the country's need to be constantly embroiled in low-level wars. 
the US needs enemies to justify our absurd military spending, including the hundreds of billions of dollars we spend on PMCs. And they won't have that justification unless we have a population of people force-fed pro-war news 24 hours a day on every major network. After the Second World War, news coverage of the Soviet Union immediately became hostile. Everything they did was considered a threat to the American way of life. Our only goal became beating the dirty communists. That Red Scare propaganda has seeped so deeply into our national consciousness that it's still a problem to this day. But that's a topic for another video. Fast forward to the fall of the Soviet Union, and the US had a problem on their hands. Our big enemy had been defeated. Capitalism now reigned supreme. What happened next? We entered a decade of malaise among the general public, with the US frantically trying to get us involved in new wars to fuel the all-consuming military-industrial complex. 2001 comes along, and suddenly we've got our answer. An attack on US soil is just what the nation needed to spark the bloodlust again, and the networks ran with it. But this time they were more sophisticated. Instead of naming a single enemy, we branded this new conflict the War on Terror, so we could finish meddling in one country and say, look, there's some terror over there, and invade an entirely different country. Fast forward nearly 20 years and here we are. A country of people who are finally fed up with war in the Middle East. It's old news. Public support for military action in the region is at record lows. But look, what's that on the horizon? It's China. They're communist. Remember the communists and how bad they are? If you turn on the TV today and watch any news coverage of China, you'll notice one thing. It's all negative. All of it. Every single action China takes is considered military posturing against the United States. Why? Because, like the Soviet Union, China represents a rising challenger to US economic domination. It has nothing to do with China threatening to go to war with us. They've made no indication that war is even remotely enticing. But that doesn't matter when we have news networks that can spin the narrative to make any country seem like an existential threat. Okay, but how does all this relate to private military companies? Well, consider how the nature of war has evolved over the decades. We've gone from massive troop deployments to remote strikes from miles away. We have less and less need for large numbers of soldiers to enforce the nation's will on other countries. The number of private contractors has increased dramatically since the 90s, and their use has skyrocketed among corporate and government entities alike. The reasoning is simple. Why rely on the official government arm of US imperialism when we can outsource our crimes against humanity to a third party, thereby granting ourselves another level of plausible deniability against all accusations? We didn't overthrow your local government and install a puppet leader, it was that PMC over there. The PMC gets shut down, the people behind the operation rebrand themselves with a new name and legal documents, and they're back in the game. As we saw with Blackwater's massacre in 2007, it's incredibly difficult to prosecute PMCs because the nature of their work is inherently secretive and conducted in other countries with very little oversight. Private military companies are nothing more than a convenient way to pursue violent imperialist goals without dirtying the hands of the US military. Money that would have been spent on the military is more and more often being diverted to fund private groups of armed thugs and murderers, often veterans of the armed services who have demonstrated a capability for incredible cruelty. This is the future of warfare, a hands-off approach from the official branches of the military with a heavy investment in more secretive, more violent, and less accountable paramilitary groups. These groups not only enable state violence, but also allow US corporations operating overseas to pursue their own violent forms of suppression of competition or resistance. So yes, you should be angry that the president pardoned war criminals instead of whistleblowers like Assange or Snowden, but realize that all of this fits the theme of American imperialism perfectly. Revealing the wrongdoing of the state is treason, but committing the very crimes that whistleblowers have revealed is service to the nation. The media gets to criticize Trump for doing a thing that is objectively bad, while downplaying their own role in facilitating our violence against these victims and millions more around the world. The pardons send a message to other PMCs that they can operate with impunity, that no matter what they do, they'll get away with it. We should expect to see a continued expansion of paramilitary action in US occupied regions. It checks all the boxes, plausible deniability, outsourcing of labor, profitability, and a furthering of US imperialist goals. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is supported by my patrons on Patreon. This type of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing explicitly anti-capitalist content, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page and join our growing Discord server at patreon.com secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. 
you can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.